Hello, everybody. My name is Jim. We're gonna and uh, we're gonna talk about secure coding, basically. Most talks that I see about application security talk about how you can hack things in great ways. I'm here to tell you, hacking is easy. Hacking is not even security, really. Hacking is just looking at a piece of app, a piece of software and listing the bugs that you find. That's a very small part of security. Yet, when we see the news, when we see different programs in school, a lot of times the focus is how do we hack the toaster? How do we hack your toy? Or how do we hack the server or the software? But that's easy because most software has security problems. You want to know what security really is? It's building networks and building software that really has deep security properties. This presentation is here to talk about that. And I want to encourage you researchers, you go and hack a toaster, because now toasters have Bluetooth, and toasters have you know, internet access, and toasters have a little screen on them, and toasters you know, have all these different features, and you can hack the toaster. Great job in hacking the toaster. Now that you're done hacking the toaster, get to work and learn how to build and manage secure software. That's what this presentation is about. Now, I'm, I'm one of the board members of OWASP. OWASP is something that's very important to me. When I joined OWASP back in 2007, 2008, I'd been a software for a long time, a software developer building enterprise applications for many years, but I never you know, learned about security. And so I learned about security through the OWASP Foundation. Once I started studying security, in the beginning, I asked a lot of foolish questions because I was new at this. My questions got more and more intelligent over time as I learned. That's what we do at OWASP. We're here to learn, right? And so OWASP has become so important to my life and has brought so many opportunities to me because as a developer, there's a lot of developers out there, right? How many people in the room are developers of software to some degree? Yeah, you developers are all over the place, right? Now, how many of you developers believe, would put your career on the line to say that the software you're building is very secure. I'll say that one. So there's a, a many less raise their hands, right? You developers who, who say you know and are learning about security, you're the future of software because we need to write secure software to survive. And OWASP has been the place for me where I learned how to do that. So I want to give back in some way. So here's defense number one. I'm going to talk about the top 10 defenses that all of you developers should master to achieve a good place when it comes to security. So number one, the most important security control. This should be review for all of you. What is a parameterized query? What do I mean by say parameterized queries? Why is this number one for secure coding? <coughs> What's you? You with the hippie hair. What? <laughs> hippie. No, no, you. You're the hippie. What? It's a counter to SQL injection. That is exactly correct. Raise your right hand and now pat yourself on the back. Go ahead, go ahead. Good job. Because not only does parameterized queries stop SQL injection, it's also going to make your code run faster. Let's talk about this. We know SQL injection. This should be something. Every, who here has heard of SQL injection before? The entire room. All right, everyone hand down. Be honest now. Who here has heard of parameterized queries before? That's a, a still, still most of the room. So we know what parameterized queries are. Now here's a problem. Here, here's a problem, right? Here's a problem. The problem is that a lot of products, a lot of software developers, and other, other techniques to make, I got it, it's okay. Yeah. No, please, please. Other, other techniques to make the software more secure is they try to use a validation technique, right? Validation takes input and applies some rule to it to try to make that input secure or recognize when the input is insecure and reject it. Look at this email address right here. Is this a valid email address? Absolutely it is. Yes, it is. In fact, if you email this and use my domain, use manico.net, I'll get the email in a few minutes and I'll respond during break. This is a legal, valid email address. Now, is this a safe email address from a SQL injection point of view? Absolutely not. 
Check a look, take a look at this scenario. We, we're just trying to update the email address in our code. So we get the email address and put it in a variable. Then we take that variable and put it in the middle of a query, just like this. Update user, set email to be the new email address typed in. No big deal. But that email address, that valid email address that your security software said, great email address, that the RFC for HTML5 says, great email address, that the RFC for legal email says, great email address, and your code, because you're a master programmer and you did a little bit of validation, your code says it was just fine. But then this happens. Game over, man. Game over. You put that email address in the middle of this query using the dangerous technique of string building and look at number three, that's the final query. Update users, set email, quote, quote, dash, dash. What does that, hey hippie, hippie. What does dash, da I'm a hippie too, I'm from Hawaii, so it's okay to be a hippie. Be proud of your hippiness, right? What does dash, dash do in SQL? It's a Take your other hand, your left hand now, and pat your other shoulder on the back because you got it exactly right. Dash dash is a comment, and everything after that gets ignored. Yes, sir? Uh, it, might flow too slow. it depends on the query engine. Yes, you're right. You need to space after it, but you're ruining my story. It works in other query engines. But you are, you are that correct, and that does, this would not work against MySQL. It will work in other database engines and older versions of MySQL. But the point is still intact here, right? You're, that's a, by the way, I, I, give, I talk about this slide a lot, and I know it's not exactly correct. It's just trying to get a point across. You know how many people actually recognize it's not exactly accurate? Maybe one out of a 1,000. So no, no offense, hippie. Give yourself a double high five. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're right. But you get the point I'm trying to make. You can have an email address that is valid, that is still in completely dangerous when you put it into an injection sink, right? And so that's what ends up going, some, against some older embedded databases, it will cause injection. Yes, sir? Yes, you sure can. That's part of the RFC as well. So my homework is to fix the slide because you guys are a little bit more detailed than I'm used to, so, but you're right. But you get the point, valid email can still lead to a security issue. And we want to code with query parameterization. This, should be, this is easy to do. We haven't even got to the real complex stuff yet. We have query parameterization in .NET and PHP and Java. A lot of people say, don't worry about NoSQL databases because they're not injectable. Go look at every NoSQL database. They have either HQL, if you're Java talking to it, or you have OQL, or you have a SQL add-on to even NoSQL databases. When you look at NoSQL databases, and look at the bottom here, that's Hibernate talking to a NoSQL object database. It's really easy to put data into a database. Uh, it's, it's very easy to put data into a NoSQL database. But it's very difficult to get data out of a NoSQL database for advanced query type of operations. So very often when you're trying to do advanced queries against a NoSQL database, you'll either add some SQL variant or add some additional engine to it to accomplish that task. They're like the Hotel California. You can put data in, but getting data out can be complex in certain situations. So even when you're using HQL or OQL to talk to a supposedly NoSQL database, we still want to parameterize. Even Perl has this API. So that's easy, number one. Just parameterize your queries everywhere. There's a lot of excuses not to, but don't listen to it. Parameterizing every variable will also be a big performance improvement. Let's talk about encoding next. So whenever we have data from the user, untrusted data, we, we you often want to use it in some kind of parser. So think of a common web application and what parsers we have. We have the rendering of HTML, that's a parser. The rendering of JavaScript, that's a parser. The, the, taking an operating system command and executing it, that's just a parser. Taking a SQL statement, that of course is a parser to some degree as well. Uh, LDAP, all these different syncs where we're gonna use data from the user is a potential for injection. The main defense to stop injection is to do some kind of escaping, to convert data from a dangerous context to a less dangerous context. One form of injection in the user interface 
is called cross-site scripting. How many of you have heard of cross-site scripting? Almost the entire room. So I'm going to move on here. The different attacks. And, 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 and interesting note, cross-site scripting, a lot of teams will say, we don't have to worry about this because it's only a small bug. We'll fix it later. How dangerous do you think cross-site scripting is? It's, it's critical, and most of the apps I work with, which are very social, heavy features, this is a critical bug. And the kind of damage I can do with cross-site scripting, again, I can, I can break any cross-site request forgery defense, scan through your machine, deface the website, steal session data in many cases, steal any data off the page, set up a keystroke logger, you name it. This is a top-tier vulnerability. And these are both real-world attacks for defacement and for cookie theft when we have a non-secure cookie or a non-HP-only cookie. So let's talk about the defense. What does the browser think you're doing when this character lands in the user interface? So I'm an attacker. I change my profile with an evil code. Then a victim reads my profile, and they get to this character. What does your browser think of this character? It's opening a tag. So does your browser think of this as display data, or they think of it as code? It's code. How do I put this character on screen so it's display data and not code? Ampersand LT, semicolon. That's the defense. And you don't want to do this by hand. You want to use some kind of escaping library to do this for you. And so in .NET, there's the built-in anti-XSS escaping library. In Java, one of the OWASP projects is the OWASP Java Encoder project. Java does not, unlike .NET, Java does not have an escaping engine built in. So we need to use some kind of third-party library to do this. In Java 8, for Java EE8, they're considering adding an escaping library in, but right now we have to use third-party code. This is written by Dr. Jeff Ikonowski, who's a robotics professor, and uh, wrote this using uh, a, a very, uh, uh, very performance-friendly way of, of dealing with string manipulation and using thread pools to accomplish this in a high-performance way. So we see a lot of big companies using this. This is a Java escaping library. There's a lot of different contexts for escaping. And I went, Jeff, why why did you build all these functions uh, up at the, up at this up until this time? All the other escaping libraries for secure coding, they only had a few APIs, and they they escape every character. But what you did was make more granular APIs, and you're not escaping every character. How did you figure this out? And you know what he said? I went to the different engines. I reverse engineered IE. I went and grabbed a rendering engine out of Firefox, and I went and grabbed WebKit. And I studied that carefully for a couple months to see how they would deal with these weird situations. And then I set up a bunch of triggers monitoring their code base. So if they change it, I'll know about it so I can change our library. And that's how I made these decisions. That's the kind of research I'd like to see you doing as well at this university. How to use a library? This is easy. I'll show you. But why we make these choices in this library, what character should we be escaping? How do we get this escaping done properly in a, multi, in a, in a different browser in different browsers? That's the kind of research that we really desperately need in the universities. And again, there's an escaping library in every language out there. Ruby on Rails, PHP, uh, .NET's got one built in. Go, Go does it automatically in their template system. And the reform project for legacy systems. So we have all these different escaping functions to, to deal with it. And we want to deal with injection of all kind. In the SAPI, there's different LDAP encoding. It's built into .NET. Uh, we have command in injection escaping functions, but be careful here. There's different encoder, there's all kinds of different encoding functions. And there's a really good reference from Boulder Security that compares how different encoders work. I know this is a little bit boring, but this is what's important when it comes to application security. We have to understand why these libraries are in play, when to use them, and how can we make them more efficient over time. Now, before I move on, the future of secure software is not manual escaping. If I have to build a project that's brand new today, and I have to take every variable in my user interface and escape it, <coughs> number one, it's inefficient. Number two, it's like you're likely to make mistakes if it's complex. So let me ask you a question. What's the future of user interface security on the web today? What do you think we should be talking about 
when building secure software on the web for secure user interfaces. What's that? Automation. Automation. Tell me more. You're in the right family, but what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, it's a lot of this <coughs> simple um, thing that you can build interfaces that automatically will display things properly, will do them securely, will track the objects whenever it's required, depending on whatever user interface you're using. What's your name? Tiago said it exactly correct. He said automation, user interface components that do this escaping automatically. Now that sounds wonderful. Are there any examples of this in the real world today? There are. In the world of web programming, there's a project called AngularJS from Google, right? Angular is great for one page web page design, but more importantly, they have the context escaping Content security policy integration and HTML sanitization for WYSIWYG editors built into the project by default. So if you're building a new project on the web from scratch and you want to use secure architectural decisions, you should be using AngularJS or you should be using ReactJS or you should be using the Go template system because they all escape in by individual context automatically. So areas of research for you smart researchers. Hey, smart guy in the back, MySQL smart guy. How about you look at like Java server pages or Ruby on Rails and add automatic escaping to their user interface components. That's an area of research that we still need more of in common frameworks. It's a challenge. Okay. Question? No question? Let's move on. Next talk is, uh, next topic is valid data validation. This is basic for secure software. Some smart guy. Smart guy with the smart OAuth questions. You ready? Give me a rule for how we should do input validation in any kind of API or web software. You're up. You. No pressure, but where's the answer? Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Are you ready to play? So we have all these variables, all this input from request data coming into our software. Which variable should we apply input validation to? Yes. Now, what kind of rules should we put in place? How do we, like, do we, are we looking for attacks? What kind of validation rules should we have in place in our software? Or give me an example of one rule. Hmm? This is the most important one. Because, uh, for example, think of a password field. Many of the pro, uh, software that we use to protect passwords take a lot of time to run. So we look at the Django framework back in September of last year, and they didn't have a limit for password size. They would allow unlimited passwords, which let you denial of service Django easily with one request. The rule I'm looking for is you want to define what good data is and reject everything else, right? And this, and the problem is that's not perfect security. A lot of software systems, they say that if I can validate and it's good data, then it's going to be safe data. And that's unfortunately not true. All that valid data means is, is that the data now fits the proper semantics of how your software is supposed to work. So here's an interesting specialized area of validation. This is what I'm using tiny, ever, ever heard of tiny MCE anyone? Tiny MCE is a WYSIWYG developer, a, a WYSIWYG JavaScript component. You apply it to a text area and it becomes like a Word document, like a normal text editor. <coughs> and you can do bolded text, you can make it links and bullet list and change colors. And when you hit submit on a tiny MCE component, a very common component on the web for administrative inf interfaces, it submits to your server an encoded chunk of HTML. So as an attacker, can I change the HTML? Absolutely, it's coming from the browser. So how do I, on the server, take an arbitrary chunk of HTML and guarantee it's safe HTML? That's the, uh, I'm, uh, th th that's the right direction. You want to whitelist proper tags in HTML. But how do you build that code to do that? Are you going to write me a regular expression to do that? 
Is regular expressions the right kind of thing to parse HTML? Absolutely not. There's, I, I agree, and there's, there's a better way to do it. Um, so the way that, and, and I agree, you're right. That's, that's the right answer. Some kind of HTML sanitization engine. You want to take bad, possibly insecure HTML, apply a rule system to it, and what comes out should be safe HTML, right? <coughs> this is a project from Michael Samuel from Google who saw how OWASP projects were doing this and said we were all wrong. So he wrote his own SAX parser and his own rule system that you can apply to a chunk of HTML to see if it fits the rules or not. And this is, you build a policy, you pick which tags are legal, you run a cleaner through it, and what comes out is a safe variant. So in Java, I use this, and there's this, there are tools to do this for you in every major language. There's the Google Kaha project for pure JavaScript sanitization. There's the Python Bleach project. There's a PHP's got the HTM Laud project. It's a, the one built into .NET that's broken. There's a GitHub project. There's a Ruby on Rails sanitizer. Java has the one from Google. So these components are there for you. In some technologies like Angular, it's built into JavaScript. In other languages like Java, <coughs> you have to go to the third party library to figure this out. And all these libraries have different levels of security. So, research. Where should we go? Researchers, this should be built into languages. We need pe researchers who understand this to go to the Java uh, community process, the Ruby on Rails team, the Python Django project, and get these HTML sanitizers built into the language and maintain the core of the language. So super smart people in the back, you're looking for areas of research. These are areas of research for secure software that we need to invest in so it's easier and less expensive to build secure software. So who are the people in the room who said, yes, I know how to build secure software? Who said that earlier? So is building secure, yeah, I'll start with you, Tiago. Is building secure software more expensive with a team than building insecure software? No, it's just actually it's cheaper. It's cheaper long term, right? Yeah, but, it's but the process of, so if I said, okay, this team, you need to build me a new startup piece of web server and it must be perfectly secure. This team, just get it done. Don't worry about security. Just get it done because we're going to TechCrunch next week and we want to get our funding, right? So just get it done. It, who's going to get it done faster? They're going to. So well, the point I'm trying to make is building secure software, at least up front, it's going to cost you more money and resources. When you have a team of advanced developers who all get this, <coughs> when you have a team of advanced developers who all get secure software, you ha then, you, then it's cheaper. How many of you work on teams with a bunch of developers who all know secure software? The answer is none of us. That's the problem, or except for you, Tiago. So, there's many other areas of special validation, like the file upload workflow. Um, I'm going to skip this to make up a little bit of time. Let's talk about access control for a moment. And, and uh, you know, the, the problem with most access control, he now hear me out. Every single framework and language in the world today does access control wrong. That's a big, arrogant statement, but I'm American. That's how we roll. I'm sorry. So let me explain why I'm so arrogant about this topic. What kind of access control do we see here? It's called RBAC, right? Role-based access control. Which languages, programming languages, default to role-based access control for, all the, for their security? That's pretty much every language. It's Ruby on Rails, it's Java, it's .NET. These are all role, and the, all of Java's API security is based on roles. Almost every language out there is based on roles. Is that true, everybody? Roles are terrible for security for enforcement points. When I, and, and when we look at access control, there's all these different aspects to access control. There's the access control rule engine. There's the access control enforcement point. There's the access control, uh, uh, there's, other, there's other aspects to it, but let's talk about the enforcement point. That's where you're in code checking a certain rule. That's the enforcement point. And what most of us have been taught to do is to use roles. And I'm here to say stop doing that. 
The problem with roles are twofold. So here's a game. I'm building a Star Wars game. In this game, the, the current player is wielding a lightsaber. Does everybody here know what Star Wars is? Has anybody never seen a Star Wars movie before? Has anybody here not seen Star Wars? Ever? Okay, good. So I don't have to kick anybody out. So um, um, the, the user is about to wield their lightsaber. Remember, only Jedis can wield a lightsaber. Why can a normal person not wield a lightsaber? Martin, suppose I took a lightsaber and I said, hey, Martin, here is a lightsaber. It is the sword of the Jedi, and it's built of a big laser. And Martin's like, oh, this is awesome lightsaber. And he starts playing with it, right? What's Martin's time to live when he starts playing with the lightsaber? Maybe a minute. Then, oh, I missed. You're done. Sorry, Martin. Sorry. So if the user is a Jedi, or if the user is a Padawan, a trainee, or if the user is a Sith Lord, or if the user is a Jedi-killing cyborg like General Grievous in the movies, then we let them wield the lightsaber. Here's the problem with this. What if we have to add a new character in? Oh, no, Han Solo gets to use a lightsaber in the, at one point. So what do we have to, he's, it's not going to work. What do I have to do to fix that role system? I have to change code, maybe in many locations. Or how about this? Disney buys my game, and they want to change this to Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and all different characters. What do we have to do? We have to say, if the game is Star Wars, check these roles. Or if the game, if the game is Disney, check this role. So that's called sharding, when I have different customers who need different access control rules. In all of these cases, role-based access control does not work well. Or what if you have to check specific to a piece of data, access control doesn't work anymore, horizontal access control. That's why we should be moving to this. This is called a capability system or a permission system and access control. This is not exciting, it's kind of boring, but if you leave your university as a professional programmer and you're getting interviewed about security and they ask you about role-based versus capability access control, you're already at the senior level. In fact, if they don't ask you, find a way to get into the conversation anyways. It will help you be more valuable to your company. So now I'm just saying if the user is permitted to wield a lightsaber. So it doesn't matter what the user's role is. Behind the is permitted function, we might look up a database and check which customer it is, check what the rule system is, and then apply it. And now we can set this enforcement point once and never change it again. We can even have this enforcement point be specific to a piece of data. So the, the, the different users may be drivers of this Winnebago, but I'm saying <clears throat> if the user is permitted to drive Winnebago of a certain number, then let them do it. So now I can have a, a check in here that's specific to an individual piece of data and have a different rule system for every customer. Now we're doing modern access control as opposed to the roles that most languages force us to build. Let's talk about authentication next. Another big area of security, it's the front gate. And let's talk about one of my favorite topics, password storage. And so how should we store a password in our database specific to user authentication? What's that? What's that? A salted hash? I, I think that, with respect, a salted hash, it, it's a little bit better than plain text. Who said plain text, by the way? Hippie, get out. You're out. You're out. No, 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 no. you may say that. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Salted hash is actually a really bad idea. I mean it with respect. Here's why. So if I want, suppose I stole your database, what would I get? I would get the salt, your salt in the database, and I would get the hash. Guess how many attempts I can make against a salted hash in one second with 10,000 euros of hardware? About a trillion, actually. So, I'll, so here's how it works. Here's hash. I can, either, I can get the software Hashcat, which is, a, which is a free piece of password cracking software, and I'll get this basic Windows machine or basic uh, PC and get like 10 of them and network it together. I use a bunch of video game cards, and using about 10,000 euros worth of hardware and free software, thank you so much, Martin, and free software, I can do about 500 billion to a trillion hashes, not per day, not per hour, 
per second. And so how would I get a good password list? I'll go take the dump from Sony, RockU, eBay, and every major, every major password dump out there and combine that list. And now I'll make a trillion attempts against your salted hash system. I grab the salt, I uh, add it to a password, run a hash, and compare. And I can do that not a thousand, not a billion, but a trillion times a second, I will get to your password fast. So that's the problem with the salted hash. The problem with the salted hash is that it's fast. So we want to make our password storage system slow. How do we do that? So let's talk. What's that? What's the answer? Go ahead. That's, that's the only right answer, an adaptive hash. And how slow should it be? As slow as we can make it. So let's talk about password storage cryptography for just a minute. A kind of interesting area in authentication. Because the whole point is your database is going to get stolen. We want to make sure that we have time to fix the problem if it does. And by the way, whoever said salted hash, that's what the whole security community has been telling you up until recently. It's not a... Uh, it's a better answer. This is a bit more up-to-date, though. So number one, don't limit the characters in a password. Like, some people will try to say, you may only give us an eight-character password. Has anybody ever used a bank, uh, a, an education system, or a government system that said, sorry, eight-character passwords or less only? Ever seen that before? Do you know what their error message should have been? It should have been, we're sorry, but we're still using an old mainframe, or we're too lazy to fix our code. So instead of actually fixing our code and protecting our system, we're going to be lazy and make you just you know, give us a, a weak password because we really don't care about security more than we care about the bonuses of our banking executives. I, I tried that error message in, in the bank I worked for, and they said, you can take that out now. Well, I thought it was a good error message. but. <laughs> So number one, you want to not limit the character size or size, but be careful of passwords that are too big. If I could put like a 10 megabyte password into your system, I can usually cause denial of service against these algorithms. So you were right. Use assault. Every individual user in your system should have a different and unique salt. This does the same thing in cryptography as an initialization vector in AES and similar algorithms. It's going to deduplicate ciphertext when plain text is the same. So I'm going to guess your password. I'm a, I have a good, almost mystical power in, in picking your password. Uh, may I do this? It's the same as my password. Fluffy bunny number one. Am I right? Just say yes. Say yes. See? So he's fluffy bunny one, and I'm fluffy bunny one. And if we use a hash or a salted, or sorry, if we use a hash or the same predictive algorithm, then our ciphertext is the same. So when you create your account with password fluffy bunny one, like mine, and we'll, when we create the account, I'll give you a different salt than it gives to me. So I'll say salt plus plus fluffy bunny one. So a different salt plus fluffy bunny one, protect it, and now we have a different chunk of ciphertext even when our plain text is the same. Same thing as an IV or initialization vector when talking about cryptographic storage and uh, so uh, different symmetric uh, algorithms as well. So use some kind of salt different for each e user, but it's just for deduplication. You don't have to protect it or put it in HSM. Just stick it in the database with the ciphertext. And three, what's that? Smart? What was that? No, no, no. What you got? Ah! <laughs> Stand up and do it. I'll do it with you. Ready? Go ahead. Stand up. So you're doing it right? Yeah, that's okay. Spread the word, though. Got to spread the word to everybody else. Number three, most importantly, use some kind of algorithm that's difficult to process. So the, there's three algorithms to choose for password storage. Bcrypt, scrypt, or password-based key derivation function two. These three algorithms are in the family of algorithms called adaptive hashes or adaptive key generate. They're actually KDFs. They're not even really adapt. I call them adaptive hashes too. They're really KDFs. They're really key derivation functions. You give it plain text. You give it a work factor to slow it down, and it will give you a cryptographic key that you can use for crypto. And, well, that's why it's called a cryptographic key, whatever. But the, now you have a process where you can. it's one way 
and you can slow it down. And so here's an example of what OSX uses for password storage. They use PBKDF2. You give it an algorithm, a hashing algorithm, you then give it the salt, you give it the password, and then you give it a work factor. And this, they recommend you use a thousand iterations. It's the hash of a hash of a hash. And you keep repeating that hash on the result data each time, basically. It's not exactly true, but close enough. They recommend you use a thousand in the year 2000 and to double it every two years. So our work factor today should be at least like 150,000. Uh, my systems are about 500,000. For administrators, for administrators, I use a million. We use a different work factor per user class. Now when the database is stolen, instead of taking a fraction of a second to compute each attempt, now it takes a couple seconds for each attempt. Instead of it taking me like a day to crack your password, or more honestly, like an hour to crack your password, now it takes me a week. It doesn't protect you, it just slows down the attacker. So when your password system is stolen, you're in the newspaper, would you like to have an hour to deal with it or a week to deal with it? That's what these uh, cryptographic systems are for. And even better, you have S-Crypt. Why is S-Crypt even better? Anyone know? It's memory hardened. So as a configuration option, you can tell S-Crypt to take up a bunch of RAM during processing. Now, it's more difficult for me to crack it in parallel. Usually, like, bcrypt takes only a couple K to run. You could tell scrypt to take a gig of RAM to compute, and now it could take me that much more computing power to try to crack this algorithm. But the, again, the problem, here's the problem, though. Why are these a bad idea? Has, a, has your boss ever told you, what, what's, your what's, uh, what, what's your name? Nola. Nola? Johan, Yo I'm sorry. Has your, has your boss ever told you, Johan, we've been looking at your code. We've been analyzing all your code, and we found out that your code is written perfectly and is incredibly fast and efficient, and we don't want that. Can you please make your code less efficient and slow it down? Your boss has ever tell you that? He, he, what, he, what he just said to me was, every day, Jim. So that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but that, that's the problem. The, if you're like a bank and it's payday, you may see a million different people trying to log in for an international bank, and that requires... 100,000 cores worth of CPU to process in one clock cycle. And you know, banks, they're notoriously cheap bastards. They don't want to spend all this money on hardware. There's got to be a better way. That was a joke. That was a banking industry joke. Thank you very much. You work for a bank? Anyone here work for a bank? They are uh, cheap bastards. Uh, <laughs> completely the worst. But not for executive bonuses. Oh, no, not for that. That's important input on no, I'm just I'm just kidding I'm just kidding it's funny when I when I teach in the US and people hear me say socialist things they're like oh Jim you're just a communist and I'm like okay then I come to Europe they're like oh he's some conservative American so I, I can't I can't win so let's let's move on let's move on this is probably the best way to do password storage but it, it is actually expensive this require this is called an HMAC an HMAC is basically an authenticated MIC an authenticated message integrity code like SHA or MD5 and so on but that an, an HMAC it takes a private key and it takes the plain text if that private key is gone there's no way you're gonna crack this before the sun stops working. And so, it, th if you had, um, that's actually not a joke. But in, in reality, the hallmark of good cryptography and good cryptographic storage is, as long as you can't get to my key to brute force my crypto with today's hardware, the sun will stop working before you're successful. That's actually really, honestly, a good measure of what cryptography is. And it's true. It's going to take uh, millions of years to crack this if you, if, if, with today's hardware. So how do you store a key? Smart guy. Where, so I have the key. And that's the key to my kingdom of passwords. Where do I put that key? Uh, in, the, in the database. <laughs> On offline, not much better. Offline system or a separate service where you isolate it, now you're talking. Or how about, let's put it in the file system. And eh, fail. Where should we really put a key? Where? Sticky note on your monarchy. Sticky note on your monarchy. Sir, you and Hippie, out. No, no. <laughs> Just kidding. 
Oh, I smoke way too much for that. Sorry, I can't. I'm not going to memorize that key. What is this being recorded? Hi, mom. Okay. <laughs> It's a little bit better, but I need to work in my system. So every time I go to log in, you get alerted. Hey, Joe. Hey, Al. Someone's logging in. Give me the keys. No, no. It's, it's not going to work. The, the, the only way to store a key properly is with a specialized piece of hardware called an HSM, <coughs> a hardware security module. Now you can put the key in this device. You can set it to run HMAC with a certain algorithm, seal it, and now the password and the salt goes into the HSM, the hash is computed, it's returned from the HSM, and the developer never can see the key. So if someone steals the HSM, it's data protected by an electromagnetic membrane where if it gets broken, the data's gone. So these are, it's also a cryptographic vault where the, a vault where the crypto is not being done in your code, it's being done in a piece of hardware. That's the only real good way to do crypto today. And so that's, you can run an HMAC inside of a vault like this. And as a quick note, does this password fit your password policy? It does. So uppercase, so it's an uppercase letter, lowercase letter, number, and a special character, right? So how good is this password for security? Awful. It's the first thing I will attempt against a strong password policy. There's a few problems here. Number one, it's got a dictionary word in it. So any time you have a password policy, you should at least look for a case insensitive dictionary word. And if it matches anywhere, reject. But number two, this is the, an area of research that's needed. Smart guy with the MySQL brain, right? Smart guy, you think you're smart, don't you? Say it, it's okay, I think I'm smart. You think you're smart? What's that? I think you're smart. So areas in advanced research I want to point you at, I'm, and I'm sorry to pick on you. You're just a, it's, it's for everybody, not just you. I just want to pick on you. Um, you call me a hippie and you're picking on it. <laughs> Racist. <laughs> OK, I live in Hawaii, in the rural part of Hawaii, and most days I wear a sarong only, right? Need a moment, need a moment, all right. But th this is, how strong of a password is this? What's that? It's not. But it fits most of your password policies, and it fits a common topology of passwords. The first character's uppercase, then a bunch of lowercase letters, then a number, then a special character. Who here in the room has a password of that structure? A, a significant number. So there's better ways to go about this. So. And by the, the, first of all, yeah, World of Warcraft. Why am I putting up a screen? For, and by the way, the answer here is avoid common password topologies as well as avoiding dictionary words. And so there, just go look, look up pa common password topology. You'll see a lot of research in the last year where very big systems will notice that your password fits a common topology and they'll recommend a different one. Even though it's an awkward usability thing, that's where the research is going for good password choices. But passwords are horrible for security. What should we really be talking about when it comes to authentication in the modern era? Why am I putting up World of Warcraft here? Multi or two factor authentication, yeah. Power to all people who use multi factor authentication. So, and even, by the way, even in rural Africa, where internet service is very challenging to get. We now see tribes that used to have to walk large distances to do commerce use a cell phone tower and a cell phone and a text system to, to, to communicate prices back and forth. And even some of these gentlemen are using multi-factor authentication against their bank, which they log into on their phone, then their wife's phone gets a text, and they put the code in, and over a phone in rural Africa, using a cell phone tower that they have to freaking hand crank with solar panels, and they're still using multi-factor to protect the banking, the banking account of their tribe. Not even kidding. I think this. Whatever works, right? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> boom. World of Warcraft is a gaming world that was making like 500 million euros a month when it was very popular. This is a, 
economy larger than some countries in Europe, right? It's a video game. And yet we saw a huge amount of fraud where different accounts who are guild leaders were getting brute forced because they couldn't, use, they couldn't use account lockout because the display name was the same as the login name. In a gaming world, if everyone knows everyone else's username and you have account lockout, everyone locks out everyone else. It just doesn't work. So multi-factor stops brute force very well without the need to lock accounts. And they've had this for over a decade. If you can protect your wizard and your cleric and the fireball mage with the staff and this, you should also be using it to protect like your university or your bank or your government, right? Move on. Let's move on. For, here's a multi-factor workflow that, that uses multi-factor in the process. Go take a look at the um, forgot password cheat sheet to look at this workflow. I say change password. Uh, they ask me a potential security question. You identify who I am with my social or citizen ID and my credit card number. Then you text me a value. Then I enter that value to the same session. Now I can reset my password, right? And so there's, there's a, and all, an identity in general is a giant topic. At OWASP, we have a series of cheat sheets that discuss this. We have the authentication cheat sheet, password storage cheat sheet, forgot password workflow cheat sheet, session management cheat sheet by Raw Siles, and the application security verification standard 3.0 authentication and session, and session requirements. Again, research. How do you define what secure software is? The only place I've seen that defined well is in this standard, the application security verification standard. Please take a look at this to help define what good software is for your teams. These are the requirements for ASVS. 3.0 has come out recently. I would start like a couple of days ago. I would start there. Data protection and privacy. When should we be using HTTPS? Always. Always. Yeah, good answer. So strict transport security, strict transport security preload, pure HTTPS sites, forward secrecy ciphers, um, certificate pinning, and, and, that's good, that's good. All of it validated. All the, uh, um, pardon me? All of it validated with MD5. <laughs> Break the whole thing. <laughs> you should be using SHA-2 or above in all those chains, right, right? Strict transport security, the, the preload initiative, you can actually submit your site and get Chrome to hard code your site into Chrome, Chromium, Firefox, and IE, so even the first hit to your site, if it's HTTP, will be switched in the browser. There are a lot of really great advances in HTTPS, different kinds of pinning, so you can detect uh, improperly signed, but uh, properly signed, but still invalid certificates. Blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna move on so I can make up some time. Air handling, intrusion detection. I'm not going to be able to talk about this either. We, this is, to me, probably the most important one in this presentation. Your fr new frameworks, Ruby on Rails, Angular, again, some stuff in Go. More and more, we see security baked into modern frameworks, so developers get these security benefits automatically. In my mind, that is the most important area of defensive research because it's going to affect not just you and your team, it's going to affect the whole world. It's going to scale for, uh, at, at a large way. So anytime you can add defense in where it affects millions, not just hundreds, then th you're doing something from a research perspective that's very, very critical. And last but not least, we have different, uh, I'm going to stop here, we have different requirements. Uh, again, most teams I've looked at when I ask them, What's secure software? Their answer is, well, my pen testers looked at it and said it was fine. This is not a good idea to roll. It's just not. That's old thinking. Take a look at the application security verification standard. Version 3.0 was released days ago, and it's going to help you as a pen tester, as a developer, as a manager, and as an educator define what secure software is in a very clear way. So. We're going to take a break. Enjoy your break. We're back in about 15 minutes when we'll be talking about OAuth 2.0 next. Before we break, any questions about anything we said? Oh, 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 this slide is already online. If you go, this is a, a project I work on called the OWASP Proactive Controls, the top 10. I, I, I don't even like top 10s, but the OWASP top 10 is very attacker centric. This is just a very similar type top 10, the OWASP top 10 proactive controls written in a defensive way. 
And this presentation is on that page, OWASP Proactive Controls in the upper right-hand corner. Cool? Qu question? Go ahead. No question? Well, one more question. Let me replace user input with any variable. User input is a good way to talk about it, but when I'm building a parameterized query, I don't even care where the, where the variable came from. If it's a variable that I need to add to a chunk of SQL, I'm gonna parameterize it without even caring where it came from. That's a mentality to build much more secure software long term. So that, that's lead, if, if that variable can be tainted, that will lead to command injection. But when should user input drive an operating system command? That's very rare. You must be building some kind of administrative interface or something to admin a machine. Overall, I look at the feature and try to get the developer to stop doing that. Why is my input running an operating system command? That sounds crazy. But there are cases where you do need to do it, primarily for administrative web interfaces that are changing you know, different config settings on your server. In that case, you wanna do operating system specific escaping. So you quote, hopefully it's not like an actual command like RM they're allowed to run. If they're allowed to type in a full OS command and run it, you're done. But if it's, if it's just like a, a parameter, like a file name, even that's dangerous, or, or some kind of display name or a rename function, you put it in quotes, first of all, and you use OS-specific escaping. That's different for Linux or different for Windows. The ESAPI project, which is a pretty much a dead project, but good ideas, will show you different kinds of OS command escaping and the different OS vendors to find this pretty clearly as well. So the answer is escaping. The real answer is, what the hell are you doing? But the other answer, if you do need to do that crazy stuff, use proper escaping, as well as OS level access control limits on what that user is allowed to do. Cool? You got it. Anything else? That's it. That's presentation one. Enjoy your break, everyone.